One wonders whether it would be a lie to say that Britannia has seen better days. The islands are in disarray, divided, torn amongst its rightful rulers, us Anglo-Saxons, we who solidified Christian rule over these lands and forged a kingdom out of mud. We did what the Romans could not, and made this land our own. But even the righteous must face perils. In the north, our brother King the Mercia seems strong, but finds itself on the doorstep of a mighty intruder, the great Viking Horde, united under the banner of the Dane Law. Not only do the Norsemen wreak havoc in England, but they've also settled on the Emerald Isle. And who knows what other horrors might arrive from Denmark and Norway if they're not stopped. And if you're really into Vikings and their sagas, then make sure to check out Viking Guard. Viking Guard is a unique mobile game set in the Viking Age, and combines deep base building with action-packed battles and kingdom management. Viking Guard is now better than ever, and in celebrating its first anniversary, has teamed up once again with the Vikings TV show to bring an authentic and epic experience. You can now experience the return of Ragnar and play as Bjorn himself, and rule the Farian Island as you develop them, and even better, Bjorn, much like the game itself, is completely free to play. Expand your territories, grow crops, take care of your pets, train and collect your Viking heresy lords, or even develop romances in Viking Guard, and do it all to a soundtrack composed by industry composer veterans on iOS or Android, with all new skins and collectibles, still completely free, but now better than ever. So make sure to check out Viking Guard on iOS and Android right now. And by the way, while I have you here, only 8% of people watching this video are subscribed to the channel. If you enjoy my content guys, it would just mean so much to me if you took the time to make a simple click and sub to the channel. It goes a long way in helping my content reach further, and hopefully also help you in knowing when there's new content to be enjoyed. I'd really appreciate it. Our ruler, the mighty and ambitious King Ethelred, has grand plans for Wessex and beyond. The liberation of England lands from the Viking yoke is paramount, and he will not rest until Wessex, no, all of England, bends the knee and calls him king. But the Vikings are powerful and numerous. The Scots are likely too far away and too mired in their own disputes to be of any help in this great war, and the grand kingdoms of the continent too far away and too preoccupied with wars of their own. No, the unification of England is our great mission, and ours alone, and Athelred will see it done before his time is ended. Athelred rules proudly from Winchester, his lands prosperous enough, but far too weak to be a force to be reckoned with as of yet. In his mind, in order to assure the kingdom's independence, it needed to be able to feed itself, to rely on its own soil for prosperity. He ordered the raising of farmland outside Winchester, and even oversaw the establishment of London as a centre of trade, founding the city's first ever market street. But more than the securing of sustenance and trade, a kingdom's best chance of continuous prosperity laid in its alliances. Athelred looked across the lands and saw nothing but potential enemies in his path. But two kingdoms stood out on his map, and Athelred was already thinking streets ahead. He sent diplomats to Scotland, securing a beneficial pact of non-aggression with the red-haired king. It would certainly come in handy if our borders were to close in on each other. Another was sent to Wales, a potentially most useful partner. You see, if he were to war with the north, securing his western front would be most vital. It cost our king a heavy pouch of gold, no doubt, but Athelred considered future guarantees for short-term gains a good and just trade. For the moment, he bided his time. As the seasons went on, he set his scholars to research ways of warfare, attempting to modernize the system of barracks in Wessex. Reports of battle came in from the continent, not far from our own borders at all. But the goings-on among the Franks mattered little in comparison to what would transpire the following year. In a battle for their de jure lands, the kingdoms of Glywysing and Wales found themselves at war. Athelred saw his chance. For nothing else but the goodness of his heart, he joined his friend King Rodri in his campaign. Of course, off the parchment, the trading town of Caerwent would be much better off in Wessexian hands than Welsh ones, and could very well be used as a staging ground for further northern campaigns. Athelred acted swiftly. He moved his army west, leaving Winchester in spring. Not only did a solar eclipse frighten his men, but scouts reported of a hostile army across the river Avon, forcing him to take precautions. With what gold he had, he recruited former Vikings turned mercenaries, ready to serve the new land's true king. He set up camp by the river and sent for Oda, a trusted general, to aid him. But Oda was careless. On his way to Wales, he trespassed in Mercian lands, placing unsteady relations on even shakier ground. The armies wasted no time. Once all the men were mustered and new Viking countrymen taught proper English, 
Athelred besieged Caerwent before the Grand Welsh army could arrive from beyond the Cambrian Mountains. Seeing as the local garrison was mighty, a rapid assault was out of the question. Athelred and Nada braced themselves for a long siege. Fall turned to winter, testing the resolve of their men. But before long, winter made for green trees and the blue skies of summer, and in the warmer months of 1870, once the defending garrison had all but succumbed to starvation, Athelred saw his chance. Despite the Caerwent forces being depleted, a siege was nevertheless a siege, and the enemy came from several fronts, even the sea itself. To secure his flank, he ordered the men to defend the beaches, preparing his archers for the coming landing. It seemed the sailors had traded seawater for a bloodbath. Once the navy was dealt with and sent away in flight, the remaining garrison proved little challenge. By day's end, Caerwent fell into Wessexian hands, and Ethelred had secured not only a vital source of iron, but also his western front, now bordering Wales to its south and finding yet another route into Mercia. In seeking to establish diplomatic relations with the continent, he sought out the Kingdom of Brittany, a small kingdom across the sea. Trade and a pact of friendship was established with Brittany, and later that year, a trade pact with the Scots came to fruition, meaning gold from foreign merchants was flowing in from both the north and the south. Another opportunity for influence reared its head once the independent city of Boulogne was born, after years of oppression under the West Francians. Fancying himself a hegemon, Athelred once more signed the Pact of Trade and Friendship, now linked with two lords on either side of the Frankish kingdom. Perhaps this would secure the cliffs of Dover from future invasion. But some things could not be prevented. For several seasons on end, plague ravaged our towns and countryside, setting back years of progress. But a fateful event occurred not long after. Once more, Wales was on the warpath, taking advantage of a border dispute with Mercia to set ablaze a full-scale conflict. But this time, war came to Wessex. Unprovoked and even as our city suffered from disease and pestilence, the Mercians were out for blood, believing in their putrid minds that they could win a two-front war. King Athelred rode for the border, securing the road to Winchester. But out of nowhere, the Mercian king was spotted not far from the River Avon. Athelred ordered General Otta to ride west at first light, gathering up whatever free thanes he met on the way there. The king himself sent out missives all across the realm, and loyal thanes flocked to his banner. It seemed, for now, the Mercian king played cat and mouse with us. Having fled back into the forest north of Caerwent, Otta himself moved into Mercia proper, hoping he was on the right path. Feeling confident, Athelred went further, crossing the Avon on its northern tip now in full view of Tamworth. As the mouse he was, the King of Mercia once more stood outside Caerwent, forcing Otta to return south in pursuit. But our wise king saw no reason to delay. He stormed forwards towards Tamworth, setting up camp outside the city walls with ramps and towers in no hurry for the time being. But dire news came from the south. The Franks, sick of the ambitions of Brittany, had moved in to crush them, stamping out a valued ally on the continent. With the loss of trade, expensive diplomatic treaties, ongoing war and festering plague, the king's coffers were about to run empty. Prudence was key, but Athelred knew his people would remain by his side, no matter how many lashes were required to keep them there. All that mattered was war, and the Mercian king had once retreated north, only now we knew where he was. Otter regrouped in Caerwent, maintaining local rule there before continuing on. But the siege of Tamworth went on, lasting into the winter of 873 when, finding himself under increased pressure from campaigning thanes, Athelred was forced to begin the assault on the walls. No one liked to fight in the snow, but if the Mercian kingdom was to be tamed, time was of the essence, and there was no time like the present. A steep hill worked to wear out our soldiers before battle even commenced, and the Mercian defenders felt confident on their walls, raining arrows down upon us, but not for long. As our siege towers plowed through the snow, our archers neared as well, and soon, the Mercians saw their confidence traded away for panic.
The walls were taken, but one last elite unit remained, the Mercian General Bodyguard itself. They stood tall before the keep, holding the high ground against our brave warriors below. They held out as long as they could, but once we surrounded them, the battle was all but over. For the first time, the flag of Wessex flew over the Mercian capital, and our men could celebrate our lord's birth in Tamworth. Alas, our lack of funds prevented much needed repairs to the city. In a desperate attempt to shore up gold, Ethelred raised the kingdom taxes, risking revolts in the process. To secure the new city, he appointed his son, Prince Alfred, as governor, hoping to raise support amongst the local people. Seeing what awaited on the horizon, the Mercians now offered peace and gold, but this was no good substitution for complete submission. At the same time, the Welsh took note of our expansion. Seeking perhaps to secure their own borders, they sent an emissary to negotiate a defensive alliance, giving Athelred what he sought all along, guaranteed security in the west. Athelred now had two choices. He could continue on to Chester, surrounding Wales on all sides, or move east to Torxey, only there the Viking army laid in wait, our king uncertain of their intentions. Seeing it better to have Mercia as a buffer for now, he took his army and rode for Chester, taking it with ease. In the south, Otto finally caught up with the fleeing Mercian king, ending his miserable life so far away from his home. A new Mercian king was crowned, Edmund, roaming the northern Mercian country. In a desperate assault, Edmund besieged Chester, but was driven off by Athelred himself. Deeming the remaining Mercian force as insignificant and the Chester garrison as reliable, King Athelred rode for Tamworth, preparing for the assault on Torxey, which, by now, was in full control of the Vikings. In just a few years, the political landscape of England had changed completely, with Mercia fully wiped off the map, its lands now owned by our dear king and to his detriment, the Danelaw. The Welsh were useful allies, especially as we now shared military access, but they acted as little more than that. For the time being, it suited Athelred just fine. The years ahead would be vital for the future of these isles, but before he could campaign abroad, securing the peace at home was paramount. In the short term, the king ordered the lowering of the general tax by a significant amount so as to prevent revolts as deep as the capital. What he had not expected was that the Mercian King Edmund would go on the offensive yet again. Leading an army of mercenaries, he laid siege to Chester once more, leaving the city's fate to the garrison alone. Our men fought bravely, awaiting the enemy's arrival. But not even bravery was enough this day, as the powerful Mercian mercenaries toyed with our defenders. With Chester lost, Mercia had once again regained a foothold, and our people, for the first time, felt the sting of war weariness. But not for long, the king swore, as he rode in haste back to Chester. The battle was hard fought, but we emerged victorious in the end, and with Chester back in our hands, King Edmund and his Mercia, finally, was no more. But there was little time to celebrate. As early as next year, Farmers outside London fled for their lives as a mighty Viking horde pillaged the countryside. Otto was sent from the west to the east in defense of London, and taxes were raised to normal levels to make sure new soldiers could be marshaled in defense of the kingdom itself. The news of Viking raids couldn't have come at a worse time, as Frisian refugees made it to Canterbury. By 875, West Francia had not only stamped out Brittany in the west, but now also retaken Boulogne. This was the year we were cut off from the continent entirely, staring down perhaps the mightiest empire of them all. But that was a battle for another day. We did what we could for what remained of the Duchy of Phrygia, allying with their duchy in exile. Otto had made it to London in time, and did his best to muster more men. But the situation called for calm hands. He was looking at not just a Viking army armed to the teeth outside his walls, but reports suggested another mighty horde awaited in East Anglia, and who knew what might await in Northumbria. Nevertheless, unwilling to allow the Danes free passage in London, Athelred ordered Otto to move out and meet the Viking army head-on, 
even if it led to war with Danes overseas as well. It was a dreary day for battle. With the Vikings being strong in number, and our men unsure of their ferocity, Otto saw it as his best bet to remain in formation. He set up a strong shield wall, awaiting the enemy onslaught. Despite the toughness of the Vikings, Otto knew how to utilize his advantages. His superior numbers allowed him to surround the enemy forces on both sides of the line, and with tactful use of his cavalry forces, he ran them down from behind like hammer on the anvil. It was enough to force the Vikings into a flight, and London was saved. In Tamworth, the king did more than just rest. He moved with force to Torxy, taking the Viking garrison by surprise. He slaughtered them to a man, taking the city, but he chose not to occupy it. In fact, he elected to sack Torcy first, before he days later returned to liberate the Mercian people, this time as his own subordinate allies, in an attempt to create a buffer between himself and the Vikings. Mercia was back, but only by the grace of our good king. The Viking army which had roamed East Anglia had now arrived in London, placing the city under siege. Defending the city with all this depleted army alone would be a challenge. Athelred elected once more to go on the offensive, feeling confident in Mercia's defense now that the Kingdom of Mercia was back. He rode south, prompting the Viking army to lift the siege and flee north, just in time for two riders to reach Winchester, one from Wales, the other from Mercia. War had broken up between the two kingdoms once more, and Athelred was forced to making a decision. Mercia acted as an important allied buffer, but with a small army, Wales remained the most important ally. The choice was simple, and Mercia stood alone once again. A courier arrived from Paris, noting that a large war had broken up between the continent's most powerful kingdoms. Our king approached the news with little more than a shrug as he prepared to move further north. He rode for Chester, while Otta made his way to Tamworth, and together, they cornered the army of Guthrum. The battle saw the largest army Wessex had ever raised, beating an equally vast Viking force. The caliber of men on each side would determine the outcome of this battle, but so would the hand of God and, for good measure, proper use of cavalry. And lucky for us, the Vikings had barely heard of horses. Once their flanks broke, it wasn't long before the entire Viking line fell apart, and in one swift stroke, the heathen army was hunted down and defeated. In a turn of fate, our Kingdom of Wessex remained a dominant force in Mercia and stood on the doorstep of the Danelaw. Only a week went by before Athelred was back in the saddle. He moved to Jorwick and laid to the city, while Otto was ordered to Middlebrook. Jorwick fell within the year, but Otto had other plans. In his vanity and lust for glory, he disobeyed the king, gathered up fame chasing thanes, and took his army north to Babenbro, where he met the last remnants of the Danes in England. Confident in himself and his men, this was the day he had long awaited, the day he would come home victorious, a hero of Wessex and all of England, perhaps even made prince. His army was formidable, sure, and his thanes had been paid well too much with him that day, but money was no substitute for survival itself, and the Danes were fighting for their lives. In the chaos, Otta fell to a rogue viking blade, and the thanes had no stomach for bad odds. Our men ran for their lives before being chased down and slaughtered to a man, not only bringing shame to the king, but losing the lives of many valuable soldiers of Wessex. The defeat forced Athelred to move quicker than he'd liked. He went north in haste and assaulted Middleborough, proving once again his mastery of combat. Once there, he tore down the pagan places of worship, bringing Christendom back to Northumbria. But time remained of the essence, as people were growing more wary of war than ever. 
In an attempt to end the war sooner rather than later, he emptied the treasury on mercenaries and took the army north, once again to Babenbrom, but this time at the walls. The siege went on. Hoping to end it, the Danes sent a proposal for peace, but Athelred would not have it. Winter would once again have to turn to summer before he was ready to take on the defenders. Siege warfare was his very own beast after all, one best tamed on one's own terms. As he moved his siege engines into position, he rained fire upon the enemy. The city was already tired from months of siege, but our men would show the Vikings no mercy. After a hard battle for the town center, Babenro was back into Anglo-Saxon hands. One wonders how the king felt once he stood there, at the northernmost city in the country, gazing upon the North Sea. But the truth was that Athelred had proved that the Viking horde could be taken on and vanquished to a man. But as with any viper, there is always more venom. Long ships were headed for London, forcing the general of the south, Athelstan, to make preparations. But the ships were quicker than expected and left with only the garrison at his disposal, Athelstan made every man count. As the longships approached the beaches, the men feared for their lives. The king's army was far away, too far to be of any comfort. It was up to each man to do his duty. Athelstan figured the best he could do was do what the Vikings could not, organize in defensive positions and stand their ground in defense of their homes. The thoughts of loved ones proved invaluable. The Vikings clashed against our walls time and time again, but were unsuccessful. on, our soldiers fought bravely, now knee-deep in blood, but a glimpse of hope now shone brighter than ever. Even as victory seemed near, the Viking javelin tore through our ranks, laying waste to young and old alike. But even they were driven off, and despite the loss of so many promising lives, London was saved and Vikings driven back into the ocean. That is, for the time being. They circumvented London and camped in East Anglia, likely foraging for food away from their native land. In the north, the king rode south, defeating a rebel Northumbrian army on his way. With the rich towns and cities of the north now within his kingdom, Athelred was showered in gold. He raised cities, farmland and markets like never before, people singing his praises as he journeyed through. And finally, willing to pretend with the Mercians no more, he joined the Welsh war against them, retaking Torxy with ease. With the kingdom of Mercia finally gone, Athelred finally remained the undisputed lord of the realm. He was crowned King of England in 882 and established the largest kingdom Britannia had ever seen. He might have left Wessex behind, but his legacy would remain. To mark his new reign, he commissioned the minting of new coins in Winchester, and as Athelstan finally drove out the remnants of the Danish army, his mission was complete. The reign of England would be marked by the raising of a grand new palace in the capital. The Vikings had been driven out of England, and Athelred crowned its one true ruler. Of course, his advisors always reminded him of the uncertainty of the future. A strong Viking presence still remained in Ireland, and on the continent, the Kingdom of West Francia, unimaginable in its power, dominated the entire northern coastline. But those were worries for another day. For now, Athelred could sleep well, knowing he had accomplished the task set out for him by God himself. My friends, thank you so much for watching. I just absolutely love this Viking Age mod for Age of Charlemagne, and I'm having a blast unifying England. As always, if you enjoyed the video and want more, make sure to let me know in the comments, and don't forget to leave a like and sub to the channel. Thanks again, 
and I'll see you next time. Cheers.